I will begin with um, that um, I have no idea how Dan felt after he left Leland and uh, Rock Springs and saw somebody come in after him and uh, met that person. Um, but that when I left uh, Leland, St. John's in Leland and um, Zion Lutheran in Rock Springs, I was, uh, it was not because I really wanted to go and it wasn't because all of the people wanted me to go either. And uh, I had very mixed feelings about um, those congregations and um, I had no idea how I would feel about the person that came in and uh, followed me. And uh, it was a great joy uh, to meet Eric and he's part of our tech study group. He's, uh, that we've had a chance to talk on any number of occasions and um, and that it's, it's been one of those wonderful experiences of, of witnessing the work that he's been doing out there. And then as I run into former people that I knew uh, from those congregations, hearing the stories of, um, of their delight and their pleasure at having Eric be their pastor. So uh, it's, uh, it's been a really wonderful experience and, and uh, I deeply appreciate his his thoughtfulness and, uh, and his care to scripture and his care for the church. Um, Eric is married to, I'm going to massacre this, I know I'm going to do this, Daisy Verdejo Macias. Um, that uh, they met online in 2006 and, um, and that they got engaged in 2009 and um, as all good interns do, Eric and Daisy were married on, during his internship in January of uh, 2010. They returned to uh, LSTC and, um, and upon graduation that Eric was called to uh, uh, St. John's Leland and to Zion Rock Springs. Um, Daisy is presently working as a receptionist and a translator for the Reedsburg school system. And um, um, that, um, and while they have been living in Leland, they have had, had a, uh, a, a young child, which never hurts in a congregation, that uh, Lana is, is their daughter. She's with us today somewhere. Okay, <laughs> we welcome you to be here with us today. Um, and as I was, uh, as we were talking in the um, um, racial equity and ministry team, that um, one of the issues that was was brought up was um, immigration and naturalization and how that process works. Um, earlier this, uh, this year, well, I guess it was late last year, um, that, we had, um, that we had someone come and speak to us about some of the issues of illegal um, uh, entry into this country and the causes for that. Uh, but, and that uh, but we didn't really talk about um, the whole process of becoming a citizen here. Um, as I have uh, grown up, that uh, I have found that if you really want to know what's going on in the world, that you need to travel there. Um, if you can't travel to other places to find out what's actually going on there, that you need to do a lot of reading. And if you're not going to do a lot of reading, find somebody from that country and speak to them. Um, and, uh, and let them talk about what some of the issues that have gone on in their lives uh, that have brought them to this country and, um, and how things are still going. Daisy is one of those people that has become a citizen uh, just last year, and uh, we welcome you as a citizen of the United States. But she grew up in Chiapas, Mexico, and uh, Chiapas has had its, uh, its own sets of problems with immigration. Um, and let's see, Eric grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I think that's all the biographical information that I have on hand here. Um, I, I, um, I want you to welcome Daisy and Eric as they come to talk to us about uh, citizenship in the process. Thank you. I don't know how 
what do you see? Once Daisy figures out how to put the microphone on, I'll put mine on. Oh, well. I will improvise. Okay, uh, my name is Daisy Hartenberger. Can you listen to me? Is that clear? Okay. Well, yes, I am an immigrant from Mexico. So, first of all, I'm not a rapist or a drug dealer. So, <laughs> you are safe. <laughs> and my husband. Um, well, as Pastor said, we met online, and this is how everything started. And um, we had no idea all the process, and I guess that was for best, because if you knew, oh boy, you will be scared. And uh, so we want to let you know what are kind of those process. Uh, so even we brought, we brought some of the documents that we had to show, and so you can see something, okay? So if you have questions, you can let us know. Uh, please just ask, that's important because sometimes we just think or kind of like, uh, okay, I may have an idea or maybe not, or I hear this or that. So it's better to ask. And uh, so thank you for the opportunity to have us here. I'll follow your lead, go ahead. And okay, I'll so we are, we are going to show some slides. And, uh, yes, please. So I just have some pictures there for my family and Eric's family. So, we can continue, please. Okay, next. Okay, so uh, why do people immigrate? We have some um, things. If you can move them up, because they will come like. They're bullet like points, so just, yeah, keep pushing them. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it will be pushing a lot. <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. And until marriage, there we go. So I found that people immigrate because sometimes persecution, we know about that in many um, countries, unfortunately they have this. Uh, sometimes they are displaced by environmental influences. We have uh, hurricanes or tornadoes, terremotes or earthquakes, uh, different things. Poverty, sometimes, you know, is something that some families cannot handle, so they take the risk and just search uh, for different places to make a better life. Uh, better opportunities for their family, sometimes for their children. You know, the parents are thinking about the children. And sometimes marriage, like Eric and I. You know? <laughs> There we go. Sorry. Okay, the next slide, please. The next. Uh, if you don't hear well or because my accent, please feel free to ask me. Can you repeat that again, please? Okay. Um, so there are different categories of immigration status in the United States, as many of you will know. Uh, U.S. citizens, like mostly of uh, the people here. Uh, permanent or conditional residents, non-immigrants, well, this is uh, for tourists or business people who are coming to the U.S. or students, uh, and also fiancés, like uh, we went through that too, and of course, the undocumented. And the next uh, one, so the fiancé visa. So we see that there are three departments involved. It's not only immigration, as the, the you know, like a, a citizenship and immigration services, that's one. The second is the Department of State, and the third one is the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. So I added the link there. If some people want to, want to know more about this, we have a link. And the next one is all the steps. You know, the petition 
for the fiancé, visa application, inspection of a part of en port of entry, uh, the marriage that we have to marriage here in the U.S., and then the adjustment of status. So we have some papers that I want you to see. Yeah, so what I'll do now at this time, and then again, interrupt if you have questions, but one of the things that we'll do is I, I went through, <laughs> it was kind of fun to look at what we did the other night, but I kind of created a timeline, and I'll go through some of that, and uh, yeah, if you hold that, thanks. Um, Peter gave some of that in the introduction, but then I'll, I'll kind of produce some of the documents, and I won't pass them around, but you'll have an idea of some of what we had to submit um, for, the, for the different paperwork as we went through different steps, uh, eventually to citizenship. Daisy became a citizen last year in February, so she's been a citizen a little over a year. Um, we really started the process, the paperwork process, as far back as March of 2009, um, now you can become, and the way she became a citizen was uh, through marriage, as she said, and, and for someone who's married to a U.S. citizen, it's a, a three-year period that you have to be a permanent resident before you can apply for citizenship. So we could have applied earlier, but um, in our case, uh, Daisy was pregnant with Alana, and we said, well, we should probably finish that paperwork before the, the child comes because things are going to get busy. And, and we didn't finish that paperwork. So that, that was a delay on our part at the end. Uh, it, that's why it was, you know, sort of seven-year process. Um, it could have been shorter, but it still takes time. And, um, so the first, I, I was just looking the other night, the first email, first kind of communication we ever had was in October of 2006. And we were, uh, for lack of all, uh, another description, we are like pen pals. We started sort of as pen pals. We began dating in, in March of 2007, so yeah, five months later. We were engaged in uh, March of 2009. So we dated for a couple of years and then, and then we were engaged. Uh, I proposed on the 2nd of March in 2009. And when I returned from Mexico, uh, after that visit and the proposal, I started in researching for an immigration attorney almost immediately. And I was in the Chicago area. As Peter mentioned, I was at the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. And uh, so I looked for an area attorney, had a conversation with one who agreed, an immigration attorney who agreed to take our case. And I found that email the other night. It was on March 12th. So that's really when we kind of got the ball sort of rolling. It was March 12th of 2009. Um, and there was a, to give you an idea, I'll give you a little bit of kind of some of the costs involved too. So people have an idea what that might be. Uh, it was a $1,500 fee just to retain the attorney and have her do some basic work. Um, in hindsight, now, knowing what I know, I would have just gone without an attorney. Uh, in my personal experience or our experience, she was not a very, um, didn't do things in a timely manner and made gross errors on a lot of stuff that I myself had to correct. So uh, the first 10 documents we had, I corrected, made corrections on eight of those 10 documents um, and ended up doing a lot of the work myself. Uh, and then I got to a point where I was tempted to just kind of fire her, but after you paid so much to you decide, do you want to just try to get what little money you have left back or hope that they do something for the money that you've paid? And you're probably not, you know, I was like, this is an attorney. If there's anyone that's an attorney in the room, nothing against you. Um, but it's sort of like, uh, or do I hope, you know, to get some, some return here or am I just going to be arguing with someone who's going to say, well, I can argue that I've, uh, put in the hours and you don't get this money back. So I, I never did fire her, but um, did not use her for anything after the first part of the paperwork. Did the rest on her own. Um, so that was $1,500. And then um, she submitted something called an I-29F. That's the petition for an alien fiancé. So I was marrying an alien. And, uh, and this, this is... So I'll set, actually, let me put this down. So this, thank you, this is a, this is a copy of the, the paperwork we submitted the first time. And actually, there's a lot of stuff that's probably not on here because this is our copy. So this, to uh, give you an idea, um, I mean, there's basic biographical information that we had to have put, it, put in here. I'm just looking for the table of contents for a minute. So we had to have, for example, a birth certificate for me, 
a biography page for my passport, a Mexican birth certificate for Daisy, a biographical page from her passport, affidavits from our, our parents, um, in my case, showing that I'd never been married before, essentially that we were, we were single and that we could legally marry each other, um, something from my mother, something from her mother, uh, something stating that uh, she planned to marry, that Daisy planned to marry me, that she'd never been arrested or convicted of a crime, uh, other, other documents like that. And then we had several passport documents. We had to show our, our airline tickets of travel that we visited each other, that, you know, basically to show that we have a legitimate relationship here. Uh, so there's lots of uh, travel itineraries and airline boarding passes that we kept, we receipts of everything pretty much. Uh, her visitor's visa, photographs of us together with our families, several different photographs. Those were times that we visited each other, both in the U.S. and in Mexico. What's that? Oh, yeah, phone records showing that our phone, we called each other, email records. That's what's not on the back of this, so it would be a lot bigger. We didn't, we didn't keep a copy of our emails and phone records for ourselves, but we did submit it with, with the other stuff. Um, so that was the first time. So this was like the first, first, uh, first packet that went. And that was in, uh, like as I said, so that was submitted in June. So we started in March, and, and about three months later, June 15th, we submitted that. And that, that was also had a $455 fee to submit the paperwork. Um, and, and then some other minor stuff I didn't include in there. Then we had, in July of 09, we had a wedding in Jalapa in Mexico with a, a Mexican Lutheran pastor who did our, our wedding. Now, that was not considered a legal marriage. The U.S., as far as the U.S. is concerned, the marriage is legal as long as it's whatever is legal in that country. So in Mexico, all people, whether they have a religious ceremony or not, will go to a, a basically a justice of the peace or courthouse to have their marriage uh, legalized. So we did not do that. We did not do that on purpose uh, because we knew that we were applying for a fiancé visa and the waiting period for Daisy to come to this country on a fiancé visa at the time was 6 to 12, 12 months. That was kind of the normal waiting period for someone to enter the country on that kind of visa. If you were married in, an, in Mexico, and it may have been different depending on what country you're married in, but uh, to, for someone to come on a spousal visa, so they are your spouse legally, the waiting period there was 12 to 18 months. So we would have waited longer, and she could not travel to the U.S. during that, while that paperwork's being processed. Either way, during the fiancé visa or the, uh, even though she had a, a tourist visa to travel to the U.S. and had been here, during that paperwork process, she could not enter the U.S. It had to remain waiting for the paperwork to be processed. Uh, it ended up taking us about seven months. So we kind of rolled the dice correctly on that, but, but basically it would have been a year to a year and a half to get all the paperwork showing that she was legally married to me as a spouse to get her to come into this country, uh, have her come to this country as a spouse on a spousal visa, which is obviously different than the fiancé. So a fiancé visa allows someone to come here for 90 days, get to know the person and decide whether or not, the, both people in the party decide whether or not they want to be married. If they're not married within those 90 days, the person who is, is not the resident of the U.S. must return to their country of origin at that time. So that's, that's, it gives you a, a three-month window. So we had our wedding, uh, and the one that we, that's important to us was the one in Mexico that we had, that the Lutheran pastor did, the ceremony for us with our families there. That was in July of 2009. And then uh, December, we had additional paperwork that we had to prepare for the fiancé visa. So, that, so the next thing we submitted is something called an I-34 Affidavit of Support Packet. And this one, I, I think this one my father helped some, send some stuff in. And so the reason we had to have this is I made below 125% of the poverty level as an intern. So if you don't make at least 125% of the poverty level in this country, you, you cannot sponsor someone to come to this country without a co-sponsor. So I needed my parents to, to back up and sign that they would be willing to sponsor Daisy once she came here. What that means is uh, the person who, who is being sponsored is not going to take any money from the government, will not take any benefits, no type of welfare, anything else like this. Um, 
And so there, my parents were basically on the hook for it, it, should she become a permanent resident, uh, not I mean not even citizen as a permanent resident, then any anything that she may need financially, they would agree to provide that she would not again not take anything from the government, and they were on the hook then till either she earned 40 credits with Social Security, you know, till she's totally vested essentially in our Social Security system, or became a citizen whichever would come first, then they're no longer responsible. And by the way, that meant that my parents, if they ever moved from their place of residence, they needed to inform the government that they had moved, had a new address. We had to do that every time too. When we moved where, where we live, you're supposed to do it within 10 days. I think actually 30 days maybe for me and 10 for you. But anyway, we have to submit that. So, so that additional paperwork was prepared in the end of uh, December, the end of 2009. And then also, this was prepared, so this is uh, something called a consular processing uh, packet. So this is for Daisy now has an appointment to show up at the consulate in Mexico. And then I think there's six well, embassies and or consulates in Mexico, so you'll go to one of those. The consulate she went to was in Juarez. Now she was in, in the south. She was in Chiapas, is the southernmost state of Mexico, it borders Guatemala. She's in the south. She traveled to Chihuahua, the state of Chihuahua, to the north. To, as you, many may know, Juarez is right on the border. I mean, it's, a, it's the mirror image of El Paso as far as geography goes. The only thing dividing them is the Rio Grande. So this was the packet that needed to be submitted as well for her to have her, uh, her consular processing in December. And so a lot of it's, uh, I'm not going to go through all of it, but it's a lot of it's repeat stuff. So... Uh, birth certificate type things, uh, passport, uh, copies of our passports, um, other documentation, uh, stuff, to, uh, stuff to show that we did intend to get married. So it was easy because we already had a non-religious, or we had a religious non-legal ceremony. So it showed, hey, we're serious about this. Our family's gathered. We paid for essentially a wedding. So we had to have that kind of evidence we could add to our sort of our, our profile now or to our, our paperwork so that they could See, okay, here's some more. So I'm just kind of looking through here. I think we had, this looks like a lot of phone records, pictures. More, there's more biographical stuff that had to be submitted. And at this point, the lawyer, this is the end of the lawyer's help for us now. So that's, that's what we've gotten. Um, and then uh, Daisy went to Juarez, and she was told on the 14th of of. Uh, January, so 2010 now, that she was approved and that she would basically be receiving what she needed, to, uh, her K-1 visa would be put into her passport. She would receive that in a DHL packet. You'd pick it up and then cross the border at a port of entry, in this case El Paso, where my dad was waiting to pick her up and take her to Albuquerque where she would stay with her family for a little while and then visit me in Nebraska. Um, so you want to say anything about your time there uh, briefly? Oh, boy. I, I reached a breaking point there, so poor Eric, uh, he's very patient because I was like pulling my hairs like, it's done. I remember that I called him and said, it's done, it's over, I'm done. I'm going back to Chiapas, I don't want to be here, it's so scary, I'm waiting and waiting and nothing. So I got frustrated, you know, just to be in the hotel room for several days and plus the crime and all that stuff, I, I, I was pretty nervous about that, you know, so tense. And, um, and then I, I was waiting and waiting and, and it's supposed that I, I left my, my phone in what hotel I was or whatever, if something was wrong, they were going to call me, but I was still waiting and nothing, so that was weird. I went to, the, to this consulate and I asked a it's supposed that I had to wait this number of days and this is more than that. So I want to see what's going on. And they say, oh yeah, wait a minute. Oh yes, your fingerprints are not well done. So you need to do it again. I say, okay, well you didn't call me, you know, you have my number. Oh no, well, I guess that you should come or whatever. Well, it should be clear, first of all. So that's one thing in, in um, Whatever. So I, I did it, I went, and finally I, I got uh, the fiancé visa, so I went through the border, not that great experience, <laughs> but uh, then my father-in-law was in the other side, so I kind of feel uh, relieved that I left Juarez. So that was my... Yeah, so I was doing a little 
uh, trying to look at the days. I think I think I could be wrong, but I think you spent 11 days in Juarez waiting. I know I know this much I could tell from the emails I looked at the other evening that she was told that she was approved on the 14th of January, but then they had the fingerprint issue. That was a Wednesday. No, that was a Thursday. The following Wednesday, she went back and, and, and kind of argued her way to talk to someone. And what you were there basically all day, finally was able to see someone and was re-fingerprinted re and then, then was told to wait, well, actually was told to wait in the consulate to have the FBI make sure that it went through this time. It did, and so then, then she had to wait for the visa. It would come through DHL. That came on Friday, so two more days after that. So it was a, so it was a good eight days after she was already told she was approved and should be expecting to receive the visa uh, that she actually got it. So that, that was a little bit of a hiccup, I would say. Um, so she entered, Daisy entered into the U.S., like I said, in El Paso, or as you mentioned, the 22nd of January, 2010. And then we were married at a courthouse in West, at West Point, Nebraska, on the 28th of January, so six days later, we had our, our civil ceremony, my internship supervisor, pastor, and we had a member of the church who was there as a witness, and then um, your brother and mother were there. I think that's it. This was about a two minute kind of thing. We have a little map there that, that I kind of show. If you click um, in the south, I don't know if you can see Chiapas, it's close to Guatemala. So practically from Guatemala to Ciudad Juarez. If you can click, please, to see the, the arrows. And then, um, even I don't know if you can see it, it's so tiny. So uh, you can, the Chiapas, there you go. Chiapas is that purple, it's at the very bottom. I, from my angle, sitting it's right below or above this. Well, now you can't see Chiapas because it's, but yeah, it's, it's basically the very bottom of your screen, the purple kind of, I don't know how to describe that shape. <laughs> A dog's head, maybe, kind of. Yeah, Daisy will point it out. <laughs> so that's Chiapas, that's the state, and Tuxla's about in the center. And one way I've heard it described, think of Mexico like a backwards J. So Chiapas is in the, the bottom of the J, the dip of the J. And then obviously up, up into Chihuahua, and then El Paso, and then Albuquerque is there kind of a little bit north of the central part of New Mexico, and then on to Nebraska. And then, and then we'll, we'll get to the rest of that in a minute, but so let me see. So we had our civil, civil wedding, and, and then at that point, what we have to do is adjust status. So she's no longer there on a, on a fiance visa. She's no longer my fiance. Now, now you're my wife, my spouse, and so We've got to adjust that status. So now we have to submit something else. And I think we had 90 days to get that in. I can't remember. Yeah. And so, I, so we submitted it pretty close to the deadline. I don't know my, the reason for that, other than maybe it took time to get it, to pre to get it prepared. And also maybe just because of what I, you know, internship life in general. But so then this is what we submitted. This is an I-485. So this is an adjustment of status. And... Uh, there were two other things in here as well that you can submit at the same time. And by the way, there's no, there was no fee for this part. This, this part, you don't pay anything. You just submit it. Uh, but then also we sent something called an I-765, which is an application for employment authorization. So all this time that Daisy, up until now, until it's approved, she can't work. So she can be in the U.S. now on the fiancé visa. Now she's my spouse, but she still cannot work. I do remember even you, you did a little babysitting for my supervisor, and he wanted a pay. I was like, she can't take the pay. I mean, she can't have it. He did. I mean, he was gracious. He got like a gift, gift card for something, you know. But it's like uh, she can't be receiving any kind of financial payment for doing work. Uh, and so then... There was the employment authorization and also an application for travel document. So she can't leave the U.S. while this is pending. So you put an application in to be able to travel out of the country in case she would want to return to Mexico. Now that you can maybe get an accept that you can get exceptions if you had like a funeral, something uh, kind of a family emergency, then you can petition to. I think in that place you go in that instance you go to Customs and Border Patrol and you make a petition and they'll they'll probably grant that. But so that would be something you know, severe illness in the family of a, a loved one or something like that. So, the, so we also applied for her ability to travel outside of the U.S., a travel document. And so this had, uh, you know, 
At this point, I think we have, like, for example, a copy of our marriage certificate showing the date of our marriage. We've got to show evidence and proof that the marriage, the wedding, you know, the legal marriage has happened. Also, I should add here, and there's like a copy of her birth certificate and other things. I should add that anything that's not in English has to be translated and a copy, a duplicate copy given in English for the people to have. And so that also meant paying for uh, translators to translate stuff. They have to be a certified translator. And in, and in Mexico, uh, things have, if, they, if they're notarized, I think, well, you can answer this better, but I think that both a translator, I mean, it's an official capacity, uh, they have a, a set kind of like a serial number or whatever anyway, and they are also a notary is more like a lawyer in this country. So it's, it's a profession that requires a substantial amount of pay for the work they do. It's not like going to your bank and having someone notarize something here. It's not like that at all. So anyway, everything had to be uh, translated into English, anything that was, so I, I see here, I'm looking at this page, here's your birth certificate and some other things, and then it has certification of the translation. So there's a, there's a translator's stamp and certification here. All that kind of stuff was translated. So we had, so we submitted this with pictures, Oh yeah, I forgot. Then you you got you got a medical. Oh yeah. So you want to talk about medical and Juarez before you came, and then you get medical again here. Yeah. So practically, um, well, like here, you know, when you are born, you have your your medical uh, history, your uh, vaccinations, and everything. So I I got everything in in Mexico. So I brought that, and I show it to the to the U.S. and. And, uh, but they say, uh, okay.